But like I was telling you about Amazing Grace and parts of that song that saved the wretch like me, I think about, you know, through many danger, toils and snares, I've been through a whole lot. And actually, I'm not supposed to be here today, but because of God. But you need to know what how, how music helps to influence. Certain songs will put your mind in a certain place to have you to consider a thing, even if you haven't gone through it yourself. And I truly in my heart believe that there is a God. Mm -hmm. Now, that music and stuff that I sang, and when I when I was going through a lot, yeah, it helped me get through it. It When I started writing and started singing and meditating with God, I asked him to guide my path. I asked him to guide me so that I'll be able to be an example for someone. And so when I did, uh, when I started singing the songs, and it's, it's straight from the heart. I believe that if you do anything, it has to come from your heart. I'm not a part of something if I can't do it from my heart. That's what I've been doing all my life. And that's what helped me all my life. You're right, that, that helped me uh, get through a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things. Welcome to the Episcopal Church of St. James the Less Online and to Let Us March On, our video series about African-American hymnody. This is the first of two episodes about gospel music. To help us understand gospel, we're graced this week by the presence of three experts. Andre Pipes, whom you've met, a wonderful soul singer from up here in Round Lake. Daryl Purvis, an evangelist and music minister for the non-denominational Liberty Temple Full Gospel Church and World Outreach Ministries. That's in Waukegan. And, as I talk, uh, the great Aretha Franklin, who illustrates gospel music's call to worship and its impact outside the church. Uh, this, of course, is her recording of Amazing Grace, sung in the slow, meditative freestyle that came up in the 1930s. And this version of the song lasts about 10 minutes. Uh, if you have seen the movie Amazing Grace or listened to the soundtrack album, both of which I highly recommend, you can hear the effect that she has on a congregation singing in this style. Using all of the ease, power, and control of her voice, she was able to draw people into the transcendent presence of God. Anything that you want to have embedded in you, that's really one way you can embed that thing in you, is putting it in a song. If we say something like, for instance, God is wonderful, he's marvelous, he's the everlasting father, he's a wonderful counselor, he's the prince of peace, him being the great I am, that's a good thing to put in a song. Why? because it's theologically correct. Now, let me take that even a little bit further. Not only is it theologically correct, because we know, a, we call it the Logos Word of God, that written and read Word of God. Mm -hmm. and, and that's always gonna be good. But then there is what we, we know God to be to us. One of my favorite songs also is, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Now watch, it's it's theologically correct because John chapter 15, verse 15 says that I don't call you a servant anymore. I call you friend. Now that's something that we know about God. But watch this, when he proves himself to be a friend to us, how? By revealing certain things to us. Because see, he said, I don't tell just my workers just anything, but you know what? I reveal to my friends the things that they need to know. Those are some examples that make a good worship song because what should it do? It, it, like I said, that thing is going to, it, it, even when we, um, United Auto Insurance, everybody knows that, that commercial, right? We can, we can sing the jingle. How much more should something about God, how much more should something we sing about God ring within our spirits? 
I love what Daryl says there about how the best worship music rings within our spirits. When we're lost in wonder, love, and praise during worship, we can sometimes feel that ringing within us, telling us this is where we're meant to be. And then that ringing continues throughout the week through the mundane moments when we're doing household chores and in those heightened moments when we need to remember that God is in control. In my research, I've been struck by the importance of women to the Gospel Church. Whether they're professional musicians or moms, grandmas, and aunties bringing up children in the faith, women have been central figures in Gospel music since it began. One of the greatest person that I think of when I think about songs and how I got my start is my mom. She could sing and I'd cry. I mean, her voice was just amazing. You know, she would hum some songs and, and I don't care where I was, I would stop what I was doing and come in there and just sit and listen to my mom. And that kept me motivated because she kept telling me, son, treat people right, do right. Keep doing what you're doing. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Even if, even if there's times that you're not treated fairly, you have to keep doing the right thing. I may not have lived a life of faith all of my life, but I grew up in church. I remember the first church that I was in. It's a, a church uh, within a... Uh, uh, a housing project on the far southeast of, east side of Chicago called Altgale Gardens. The name of that church was called Mount Olive Baptist Church. And when there was an instrument being used there, it was just the piano. One of the choir members showed me basically the epitome of an example of worshiping God, as the Bible says, giving melody in your heart. And that was my grandmother. She was one of the first praise and worshipers that I had ever seen. In fact, she did that, but, and that was before I heard that terminology, praise and worship, or just worship, period. I could see, even as a little kid, where her heart was when she would be standing at the sink, washing dishes and singing stuff like Amazing Grace. What a friend we have in Jesus. Only believe all things are possible. Things like that. So this week, we focus on how gospel music leads people into God's presence and specifically how it does so through the words of faithful women. With the exception of Amazing Grace, all this week's songs were written by women. And you can find all but one in our Lift Every Voice and Sing hymnal. If you'd like to sing or hum along, all the words to the hymns can be found in the description of this video. Thanks for joining me this week, and let's talk gospel music. In the early 20th century, black churches sang songs from white composers like Amazing Grace and What a Friend We Have in Jesus. They sang some spirituals and they sang newly written songs by black composers. And these were often in a verse chorus verse format. And these songs all endure. But what we generally think of as gospel music as a distinct style took shape in the 1920s. So our next song comes from that era. Let It Breathe On Me is from 1942, which is commonly considered the golden age of gospel music. Uh, and there's a concert album from the early 70s where Aretha Franklin's mentor, the Reverend James Cleveland, sings this song and recalls the choir used to sing it every Sunday for meditation. My grandmother would get happy every time they sang it. And in the gospel church, getting happy means more than just starting to feel good. 
It means getting swept up in a song to varying degrees. Sometimes they're shouting, sometimes getting up, moving around, but always becoming absorbed in the spirit. And that is the goal of Let It Breathe On Me. It is number 116 in our Lift Every Voice and Sing. Let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Let the breath of the Lord now breathe on me. doesn't even do it justice. When James Cleveland and his choir sing that song, it's like they're daring each other to see how slowly they can land each syllable. This is that freestyle that we heard Aretha use for Amazing Grace, full of improvisations and melismas, and it's one of those rare gospel techniques that we can trace back to a specific person. In this case, the innovator was a woman named Willie Mae Ford Smith out of St. Louis. You may remember a year ago, we talked about Thomas Dorsey, now known as the father of gospel music, and his song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Well, before he was the father of gospel music, Dorsey was a full-time blues musician, and he was struggling to become a gospel songwriter. So he would visit churches and try to sell them loose-leaf copies of his hymns. But because of his day job, he had trouble getting church people to accept him. Dorsey met Willie Mae Ford Smith when they were both on tour. And in 1930, she traveled up to Chicago for the National Baptist Convention, where she sang one of Dorsey's songs. Presumably she sang it very slowly and with lots of improv, and it was an enormous hit, and Dorsey sold 4,000 copies of the song to convention goers. And soon after that, thanks to Willie May, he landed a job as a church music director. Now, the woman who wrote Let It Breathe On Me was another associate of Dorsey's, Magnolia Lewis Butts. In 1931, the two of them... Dorsey and Lewis established Chicago's first gospel choir at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Bronzeville. The following year, they organized the first national convention of gospel choirs, and that is still going strong. And these conventions have become among the most important settings for gospel composers to learn from one another and share new songs and just generally network. They are crucial to the gospel infrastructure in the United States. And I wish I had time to talk about all the other Chicago women who were pivotal to gospel music's early success. There was Sally Martin, who worked with Dorsey and uh, Lewis to organize that first gospel convention. And then she started her own long-running publishing house. There was Roberta Martin, no relation to Sally, but who also started her own publishing house and had a distinctive piano style. She was a mentor to James Cleveland. And then Mahalia Jackson, you've probably heard of, she got started singing on Chicago street corners with Thomas Dorsey, helping him sell his sheet music. She would just sing his songs so that people could hear them. And after that, she went on to become a national icon and a leader in the civil rights movement. So we Chicagoans can be proud of our city. You can trace a lot of fantastic music back to our fair city. Now, for some early gospel composers, though, we don't even have their full name. 
Andre Pipes learned our next song from his mother. It's called If Jesus Had to Pray, and it was copyrighted in 1941 by a Mrs. L.P. Baldwin. And that is all the information I can find about her. But a bunch of vocal quartets recorded this song in the 40s and 50s, and it's unusual among gospel songs in that it's written in the 16-bar blues form. So if you're familiar with I Put a Spell on You by Screamin' Jay Hawkins, it follows that chord structure. Let's listen to Andre sing it. This is If Jesus Had to Pray. If my Jesus had to pray, what about me? If my Jesus had to pray, what about me? songs written in that specific blues form. In the next episode, we'll talk a little more about the sometimes fraught relationship between sacred gospel music and secular African American music. But if you remember what my friend Daryl said earlier about how church musicians use songs to embed messages in people's minds, you can hear how that blues form would do it. We get the first line twice. If my Jesus had to pray, Lord, what about me? And then another line that elaborates on it before returning to that first line. And it's a great way to embed that message in people. Namely, that Jesus suffered as a human and that he knows what we're going through. So if Let It Breathe On Me is a song to draw us into the presence of God on Sunday morning, If Jesus Had to Pray is a song to help us carry that holy presence throughout the rest of the week. Now, these songs come from what you might call the first wave of gospel songwriters, back when something called gospel music was still emerging as a style. Our next song is from a daughter of that generation. Dr. Margaret Pleasant Durow is a preacher's kid. Her dad, Earl Pleasant, was a pastor and a gospel singer who toured with Mahalia Jackson. Margaret's degrees are in education, and she worked for many years as a teacher in the Los Angeles school system. But starting in 1970, she also wrote gospel songs. Her first, and probably her best known, is Give Me a Clean Heart, an adaptation of Psalm 51 that is especially meaningful during the season of Lent. It is number 124 in our Lift Every Voice and Sing hymnal. And here is Give Me a Clean Heart. Give me a clean heart so I may serve thee. Lord, fix my heart.
Sometimes I am up and sometimes I am down. Sometimes I am almost level to the ground. Please give me, Lord, a clean heart that I Cleveland's choir was the first to record that song back in 1970, and once again, his version is slow. It's about half as fast as what I just sang, and it swings about twice as hard. It's really amazing. Um, as with Let It Breathe On Me, that slow tempo is ideal for drawing us into that contemplative state of worship. And there are a couple other aspects to that song, one of them musical and one lyrical, that make it sound like gospel with a capital G. Musically, the chords are more complex than what we find in the spirituals, and even more complex than what we found in Let It Breathe On Me. In episode one, you may remember we talked about the song Lift Every Voice and Sing. And this chord progression, and Give Me a Clean Heart, sort of reminds me of those complex chords that were coming out of the New England Conservatory and the vaudeville circuit, where every chord seems to lead into the next. A more simplified version of this song might go... Margaret DeRoe does is throws in all these chords with notes outside the scale. So we've got, you hear how that leads back and swells, and then, so it really sweeps you along with those chords. And I can't be sure, but I think Margaret DeRoe was incorporating into her song some of the things that James Cleveland and other excellent gospel pianists would do improvisationally. She seems to be consciously writing as part of an established style, which, which makes sense since she was a second generation gospel performer. Lyrically, the song is also reminiscent of Lift Every Voice. Now, it's not nearly as wordy, but it points both backwards to the days of slavery and ahead to the future, or at least to a contemporary setting. The second verse, sometimes I am up and sometimes I am down, sometimes I am almost level to the ground, is what scholars call a wandering verse or a couplet that would be used in a bunch of different spirituals. And in this case, that comes from Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, and I'm sure several others. And even though the song is about personal piety, its first verse, I'm not asking for the riches of the land, I'm not asking for the proud to know my name, points to a society where riches and fame are a possibility for African-American people. This is an observation of the singer Gwendolyn Sims Warren in her book, uh, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. The spirituals don't often sing about riches and fame because those things were not possibilities. But this song, being written during the civil rights movement, during the era of black pride, can point to those things, but then also point to a humility that is even greater than riches and fame. Well, our final song today 
is Lead Me, Guide Me. This is a classic. There's a hymnal that's named after it, uh, and it's by the songwriter and pianist and singer Doris Akers, who got her start in the 40s, I want to say, in Los Angeles, uh, touring with the Sally Martin Singers, from whom she learned the business side of gospel music, before setting off on her own and starting her own ensemble. She wrote over 500 songs and disseminated them mainly through recordings. And this is something that we'll get into more in the next episode, how gospel music is perhaps the first church music style to be explicitly tied to the commerce of the music business. Like, that's how people learn songs, from sheet music and from recordings. But we'll save that discussion for next week. For now, I just want you to notice verse 3 of this song. I am lost if you take your hand from me. I am blind without thy light to see. Lord, just always let me thy servant be. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. And that's a great message to draw us into worship, but then also to set us off on our way after the service is over and to carry with us through the week. And it was written and sung by a faithful woman in the Gospel Church. So, I invite you to join me singing or humming, Lead Me, Guide Me. It's number 194 in our Lift Every Voice and Sing hymnal. I will no doubt be playing it too fast, but we can use it to worship together anyway. So, thanks for joining me, and I hope you'll join me next time for episode 4 of Let Us March On, when we'll be talking more about gospel music, and specifically more about contemporary gospel music. Lead me, guide me along the way, for if you lead me, I cannot stray. Help me through